So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Andrew. I'm with Camilleri Preziosi, a commercial law firm in Malta, um, specializes in, in setting up funds and asset managers. I'm very pleased to be joined today by, by four experienced panelists. Um, before jumping into the subject, I'd like to hand over to everyone to, to introduce yourself, starting perhaps with you. Is already yep. on? Yes, it's already on. Yeah, my name is Dr. Alexander Lindemann. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, we, our law firm, we work uh, with Malta already 12 years since the existence of our law firm. Um, among others, we're setting up funds, we're setting up holding companies, um, PCCs, SECs. For, so for us, um, I think it's quite a very interesting toolbox that well complements the tools that you have in Switzerland itself. I look forward to a lovely discussion about uh, about this topic. Thank you. Maybe I directly hand over to my Thank you and good morning everyone. I'm Rachel Calero. I'm a senior associate at Camilleri Preziosi Advocates. I assist with funds and fund manager um, setups and ongoing queries. Um, I have been there now for the past two years and previously six years as well. Um, and I can hand over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Um, my name is Dominic Atsopardi. I'm Associate Client Director at Alter Domus. Alter Domus is an international fund administration company, corporate services provider and fund administration. Um, I'm uh, myself, I'm based in Malta. Um, I've been with the company for since 2011 now. Uh, my main focus on is heading the fund services um, part at Alter Domus and the regulated uh, the regulated business focus, as I said, mainly on 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 funds and and other regulated structures. Good morning. I will start by thanking Maza and Finance Malta for inviting us to participate in this event. My name is Doreen Balzan and I am Head of Investment Services Supervision within the Malta Financial Services Authority. So the function besides supervision, ensuring that our license holders are adhering to the rules and regulations, we also have a dedicated team uh, to authorizations, which assesses and uh, processes applications which will eventually be transformed into licenses, and I will evolve into this much further during mu during this discussion. Thanks, Doreen. Uh, Doreen, the first question is for you. Um, so one of Malta's um, selling points, let's say, has always been um, the MFSA's approach to licensing and, and regulation generally. Um, can you just shed some light on what the MFSA looks out for in considering whether to, whether to authorize um, new business? I'm just perhaps provide some detail on what the process will look like for a new a new business prospect looking to establish in Malta. Sure. Thank you, Andrew. So I will split the question into two. First, I will address the approach and the key selling points within the authority when processing uh, applications. And then I will focus on the key matters. What we look out for when processing a, an application, new applications. So I guess that the top selling point that I would, would like to focus on is that as financial services authority, we are very approachable. We work very closely with the industry. My colleagues in the previous panel have, have touched base on this and we appreciate the feedback that we keep receiving especially when we meet prospective applicants who come over to have initial discussions with the authority well before the actual application is submitted. And the feedback that we receive is that when they approach other regulators, um, unlike the Maltese regulators, um, they hardly get an, an appointment for a meeting. So I proudly emphasize that as regulators we do our very utmost to get to know who the applicants are we want to know um, the the type of business that will be performed in malta so we are there to listen we are 
we also, I would say, have that human element. We, 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 we put questions to get to know the individuals better. We also give feedback, ongoing feedback. Once the application is submitted, we do provide feedback, knowing that the applicants very often want to know the status of the application. And we do pick up the phone, we do send emails, we do receive calls also from the promoters themselves um, to understand where the application stands. And we do, we do give updates. Um, I think that one thing I, that I would like to mention is the, that over the past years, we've improved the, the way we work. We tried to simplify our procedures. We tried to promote quick wins and we created an environment where employees can actually come up with recommendations and suggestions and that they can question our internal procedures so that we try to simplify. We want to be efficient when processing new applications. We also acted on feedback provided by the industry, namely MASA and the IFSP, Institution of Financial Services Practitioners. We often reach out for feedback to try to get an opinion before we actually issue changes to the industry. And the final point that I would like to mention here is um, the fact that we are working on the implementation of a new system, which Claire, my colleague, mentioned earlier. Um, it may take slightly long, as with every other implementation of a new system, but we look forward within the authority to have a robust database, and hopefully it will help us improve our internal processes, especially when it comes to processing new applications and processing or, uh, the due diligence process itself. I will now move on to the second part of the question, which is um, what are the key matters that the authority, the authority looks out for when processing a new application? So first and foremost, we encourage prospective applicants to, uh, and promoters to engage with experienced advisors. These could be um, local law firm, audit firm, service providers, and so on. Having a local advisor assisting you in the application itself can simplify, can speed up the process because um, the submission itself will be smoother and as well as the submission of personal questionnaires that certain key function holders would need to submit and upload on our portal. We want applications to be of a very high standard. This again helps us to speed up the process. We do provide our feedback, our comments within a number of, let's put a number of weeks. Um, the less feedback we seek, the quicker it takes to, to finalize um, an, an application. So, Wanting applications to be of a high standard is paramount to us in the process of the application. As regulators, we want to understand the ownership of an entity, who are the OBOs, that's very important to us. We want to understand the group structure, including any regulatory history or any significant, significant events of the entity. We also want to understand the operational setup to assess presence in Malta. Again, in the previous panel, this was very well highlighted. We do not want letterbox entities. So we'll start discussions on local, present, uh, local presence at a very initial stage, even before the actual application is submitted. We also look at the structure of the control functions, namely the risk, the compliance, uh, financial crime functions. We look at the customer onboarding process, the due diligence procedures and ongoing name screening procedures. The authority also performs fitness and properness assessment on 
proposed individuals. Namely, we look at the competence of the individuals, the reputation, any conflicts of interest, the independence of mind, and also the, to the time commitment to understand the number of hours that will be dedicated to the role that, that they will be taking. And uh, my last comment would be, we also encourage the appointment of an independent director on the board. This is also specified and recommended in the MFSA Corporate Governance Code, which one can find on the MFSA website. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, Rachel, on to you. So having the dealing with fund and fund manager applications on a frequent basis, can you run us through um, what the process looks like in terms of setting up um, fund products and asset managers across both the notified and the licensed space? Sure, sure. Um, so as the previous panel have gone into some detail, um, distinguishing between some licensed funds and, and non-licensed funds, um, the main distinction is the is the condensed time to market for for the notified structures, um, for licensed entities, which can either be the funds or or fund managers. Um, the full due diligence process has to be undertaken by the MFSA, as Doreen has has gone into into some detail, um, uh, which may take which may take a few months, depending on. Uh, um, on the individuals behind behind the structure and how known they are to the MFSA. In other words, if they are set up with um, uh, certain individuals who are already who are already um, known to be competent and and experienced by the MFSA, that will as well um, reduce reduce the time the, the licensing um, process. Um, in the case of uh, the now more popular. Um, structures which are the notified alternative investor fund and the notified professional investor fund. Um, Doreen, I think we'll go into some more detail into how how condensed the time to market is. Um, essentially, in the case of the the NAIF, um, the full due diligence process is, is taken on by the manager, the AFIM, um, who will undertake due diligence at, at the point of pre-authorization as well as on an ongoing basis. Um, um, the full benefit of the NAIF structure is, is uh, that it's still recognized under the AFMD, so it is it's it can exercise the post-porting rights under the directive. Um, so you've got a, a quick a quick product in in to to uh, market in the in to investors um, and you can even um, exercise the post-booting regime through the notification process. Um, um, the NAIFs can be um, uh, invested by, by professional investors and qualified investors who are investors um, who need to invest um, a minimum of 100,000 and have um, net assets in excess of 750,000 euro. Um, as well, what what we are seeing is where some some managers are opting to um, to speed up the process as well um, for for NAFs by plugging into um, existing AFIM platforms um, and by retaining certain control through setting up an investment committee where they where they retain um, majority representation or they act as advisor. Um, they. They're fully flexible in the case of, of uh, what types of funds they can they can be. They can be real estate, equity, so on and so forth. And uh, with respect to the notified PIF structure as well, which is very similar to the NAIF structure, except that it cannot exercise the post-porting regime because it is a fully-fledged Maltese product. Um, uh, similarly, due diligence is carried out by a due diligence service provider rather than the manager. It can be managed by a sub-threshold manager, uh, local or EU, or by a third-party manager. In fact, we're seeing some Swiss managers very interested in this notified PIF structure. Um, Doreen, if I can pause you to regarding the time to market oh. of the funds. Yeah. Yes, so I think it's important that we get, give a bit of a time frame or timing to market, which is a question we, all, we are always asked. 
when meeting prospective applicants? How long does it take to process an application? And uh, approximately, I will go through quickly the timing that we will take always if applications are submitted to a good level without the need of coming and going over and over for clarifications. So in the case of licensed fund products, this normally takes between three to four months for the authority to issue an in-principle letter. An in-principle letter would mean that we are, telling, we are thanking you for your applications, that it, it is being approved with certain conditions that have to be met either before we issue the license, pre-licensing conditions, or post-licensing conditions. Once the pre-licensing conditions are met, we would be in a position to issue the license. Subfunds are normally processed within two to three months. Very often within two months, the in-principle letter will be issued. A fund manager application takes approximately five months. Whereas an application for a MIFID firm license takes slightly longer, approximately six months, sometimes a bit more, given that we are receiving a, quite a substantial amount of uh, MIFID ap sorry, applications for MIFID firms this year. We've seen an abnormal amount, which is good. And uh, of course, you need to manage well the, the timing and the feedback that needs to be provided to the prospective applicants. Quicker turnarounds occur, despite the, the months that I mentioned, quicker turnarounds occur when applications are submitted um, are of a high standard and competent individuals are selected for the key function roles. Now, the notified structures have less onerous regulatory requirements and these take only 10 working days to be included in the list of notified PIFs or AFs from the date the actual application is, is submitted to the authority. Thanks, Arine. So, Alexander, we're lucky to have someone who has one foot in Switzerland and, uh, and a foot in Malta, perhaps. So, can you explain um, maybe what the appeal is for Swiss promoters and, and, and fund managers when looking at Malta? What does Malta have to offer to Swiss managers and promoters? Thank you very much for the question. Yes, exactly, that's the case. So we um, we advise um, Swiss promoters predominantly, but also European promoters and, and fund managers when it comes to um, setting up in Malta. Um, typically, a Swiss element, of course, is, is involved. Um, typically, for example, the promoter or the um, or the manager wants to um, wants to have a Swiss bank, right? Um, that is um, that is something that is possible under the below threshold regime of the uh, AFMD directive. So um, that is that can go with, uh, with closed ended funds can go up to 500 million. So that's also for like substantial funds. That's an interesting option for open ended funds up to up to 100 million. So these cooperation with like cross border um, type of cooperation between Switzerland and Malta is something that is for our clients um, very interesting. I mean, typically our clients come, they have a product and they have a, um, a specialization and they know the, their um, investors, um, but they do not know yet what is the perfect form, right? And then they look, for example, at typical suspects for jurisdictions like, for example, Cayman, um, for example, Luxembourg, of course, um, Liechtenstein, Malta, and then we sort of advise them and 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 and, and um, talk to them, um, even what what could be a, a good setup for them. And in this context, I mean, Malta, is, of course, is like an onshore jurisdiction. Uh, um, unlike, is not in the Caribbean. It's it's of course easier to reach, and nevertheless, it's um, yeah, it's, it has a certain flexibility. Um, which one can take advantage of. And, and there, the questions we discuss with the clients uh, is, um, for example, self-managed or, or managed externally. And I think that, in addition to the knife we've mentioned as, as, as an option we have not um, 
heard so much uh, t today, yet I, the Malta um, also makes it possible the self-managed uh, structures. Um, here there are highly um, professional service providers available. Um, I mean, when we start such a structure, we, we look, first of all, we need to understand uh, as a law firm, as a, um, in specializing in funds, we need to understand the concept and, and the key persons, right? And then we, we, um, we need to find the right mix because of course we want to have um, a, a strong um, team on the ground in Malta. And also the, our, our promoters, our fund managers, they need to be willing, of course, to dedicate a substantial amount also to working in Malta. So we, that is like a very important process, understanding the, the process, uh, the, the fund concept, the distribution concept, and, and then setting, putting together a good team doing the due diligence with, I mean, of course, we have a network of, of directors and IC members that we know are very good. So those we can then recommend and, and, um, and put together the perfect team. Um, for the stand and even then, of course, as I already mentioned, this could could also could be self managed. This could be um, could be also like a Swiss based licensed manager. So there's then the cooperation between very productive cooperation between MFSA and and Finma, um, and then. Once we understand the concept, we typically make a sounding preliminary meeting with the MFSA to see whether there are any so say, roadblocks, typically not, that we've already clarified, but whether there are any additional points that the MFSA seeks are very important, right? And so that we, um, when we prepare then the application, um, we can already take this into account. And even, so there I'm, um, yeah, due to the fact, I mean, that uh, Malta has uh, once been, uh, yeah, um, Commonwealth uh, country. I mean, there's a perfect English, right? So I think that's, that's, uh, that's of course, um, that's of course extremely helpful that uh, the communication is on an on extremely high level um, and, and on, on a, on a yeah, very, very effective and, and clear level. And that 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 helps. Then, when comes when it comes to running the fund, um, of course, even there it depends on on the uh, on the type of asset classes. If it's for example, uh, um, if it's for example like an ongoing re um, reshuffle, I'm not reshuffling, I'm re rebalancing or like a long long only sh long only or long short strategy. Then you meet you need of course like a Swiss licensed. Um, um, asset manager, wealth manager, whereas when you can, um, when you have a, when you have a li illiquid asset class, you could um, even more easily also integrate uh, and have a self-managed structure um, without such a, such a Swiss-based um, Swiss uh, asset or wealth manager. And then yes, you can can work with like with. Um, with, with board meetings and, and um, dedicate him the relevant time for the asset management decisions in, in Malta. Then, of course, yes, there are of course questions and, and there also, um, um, yes, as mentioned, there are, of course, tax big four companies. Typically, I mean, the important brands are present, of course, in on the island. And so this is from my side it's it's i think it's it's important when when swiss providers enter the island with with new concepts that they um, they learn how how the island works so to speak and there um, um uh, a swiss based law firm can of course be of help to to sort of also highlight a little bit the differences between the swiss and the malta culture thank you very much um, so, Dominic, in the previous panels, we discussed the various regulatory reforms. Can you give us a bit of an overview um, as to which regulatory reforms dominate the market and even in terms of strategies? Are any particular strategies more popular than others? Yes, thanks, Andrew. So, now, I wouldn't use the word dominate, probably, because, as it was mentioned before, even in previous panels, 
Um, there are a number of different fund structures which are designed that can sort of fit different investment strategies. And given the fact that the um, investment strategies throughout the funds landscape in Malta are quite varied, so we cannot say, you know, if it's a usage funds, let's go to Malta because it's a usage fund jurisdiction or it's a only a real estate jurisdiction. The investment strategies are quite varied. We see a number of private equities, a number of real estate funds, retail funds, usage, alternative investments. So that's fitting pretty nice with the different type of structures, PIFs, NAFs, AFs, now the NPIF, uh, whatever. So obviously there would be some structures which are more popular than others for different reasons, but I wouldn't say dominating. Obviously, I mean, historically, um, the PIF structure is the one that has been in existing for most, I mean, early 2000s. So obviously, um, historically, that was, the, I mean, in the 2000s, up to the IFMD, practically, it was usage or a PIF, sorry. Um, so that, and that was possible because of the flexibility of the structure. So as was mentioned before, um, being um, outside the IFMD regime, bar the 100, 500 uh, million euro threshold, obviously. Um, having um, an investment manager, it's like a Swiss investment manager or um, from any other reputable jurisdiction outside the EU, it gave the flexibility to use that structure since it, there are very limited restrictions on the investment strategy, leverage, etc. It gives the flexibility um, to use that, that product, you know, um, as, as it pleases. So, for example, you know, we've seen a lot of cases where, like, the manager has a pool, a limited pool of investors already lined up, so the, the money is already there. The investment is uh, are targeted. What do you need? You need a product, preferably within the EU, that can wrap up those investments, you know, and gives you the flexibility um, to use the fund regime to um, optimize in terms of operations, in terms of tax optimization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, the fact that it is it falls outside the AFM, AFMD regime doesn't mean, obviously, that because you cannot market freely within the EU, you raise a closed-ended fund that it stops there. You still can continue raising capital through private placement, obviously, um, but um, it we've seen it being used a lot for family offices, club deals, pri small private banks, um, and it has proved to be um, very, very efficient, basically. One other aspect of the PIF, you know, that was quite attractive was the possibility to have a self-managed PIF as well. So basically, if someone doesn't have the license in their own jurisdiction to operate a fund, they can con go through um, a scrutiny procedure with the MFSA to get approved of an internal investment committee thus having a self-managed PIF. So that's more historically. Then, I think around 2016, something like that, the, the NAIF was introduced. So obviously, after a couple of years of assessment, sort of, we have seen a, a large increase in applications shifting towards the NAIF. Obviously, because of the time to market, it gives you the, the flexibility to market it within the EU. So that you know give, gave a lot of flexibility and an alternative. So we started seeing a bit of shift in the market. Whereas before, automatically, if it's not a use, it's fund. Automatically, you go for a professional investor fund. Then we started um, with, with the choice, even because you know. As I think it was mentioned in the previous panel, we started realizing that if you have a structure where the manager is licensed, the fund administrator is supervised by the regulatory authority, the custodian is licensed as well, it doesn't really make too much of a difference if the product is licensed or only notified in reality. Um, so from that moment on, I think then the, the NAIF became really, really um, a popular product. Now, the same thing is being sort of, since December 2023, the notified PIF regime was, was launched. 
um, we, we sort of we envision that there will be the same trajectory. So basically, the market will be even more spread out, basically, be, be, between the different products, because the, the notified PIFs gives you all the flexibility of the licensed PIF, for now, without the possibility of having, a, having it self-managed, but with the advantage that the NAIF has in terms of time to market. You know, so if you have a family office with 10 investors already there, you know that you have your investment, you need a quick product to wrap it up. The MPF is basically um, the perfect fit. You know, it can, you know, can be an alternative to Cayman funds because normally um, investment managers who didn't want to structure their products within the AFMD regime um, normally structure funds in Cayman, so basically that could be, uh, uh, that was um, a, a very um, similar um, alternative to, to those type of um, structures and activities. Basically. Thanks, Dom. On, on this point, you mentioned, you mentioned Cayman, so Kiriata Domos has a, a global footprint with, with offices kind of all around the world. Can you explain um, what advantages Malta has over the more established European jurisdictions? In terms of um, alter, not alter domus in general, so basically, obviously, each country has its own characteristics. So you can compare, um, and each country has some advantages and disadvantages. I'm sort of a bit lucky enough to deal with a number of different jurisdictions because we have offices in around 29 jurisdictions. So, but mainly, obviously closer to the main jurisdictions, Luxembourg, Ireland, UK, mainly. Um, and sometimes, even to be honest, sometimes even internally ourselves, we joke a bit when, about the different ways that sort of uh, the work is conducted. Um, as I said, um, I, I would identify probably three main, three main sort of things that differentiate the, the, the jurisdictions. Some of them were already discussed in the previous panel, I'll elaborate a bit more. So, um, one of them, I think, is, you know, the closeness to the client. So, wh what do I mean? It doesn't mean that because we say we are closer to the client, so we are the good guys, and the guys in Luxembourg, they don't care. It's not, it's, it's not that way. But sometimes, it is a fact of, you know, how things are. So, I, I look at, at our company sort of, you know, when, when you see the volume of funds that are administered by the Luxembourg office, I mean, it's incredible. So obviously without, without you know, without any prejudice, these sometimes they will start, you know, not filtering, but sort of prioritizing basically, you know. So prioritizing what it means, they will say, listen, what is my duty towards the client? What is my obligation? I have an obligation, for example, of producing and sending an NAV within five business day of the month. Have I done that? Okay, I've done a good job. I have an obligation of sending investor statements. I mean, a bit up to 10 business days. I've done that? Yes, I've done a good job. I think we go a bit further, okay? So I think we don't just look at what are our obligations, but how can we sort of help out the client, you know, to be uh, more successful um, in his operations. And I can give you a practical example about this. For example, m more than once, I mean, I've been approached by clients who already have funds with us, for example. Um, they identify some new targets, um, and they approach us and tell us, listen, can you help us a bit in doing some capital raising, basically? Obviously, as fund administrator, that's not my role. It is not my obligation. So, but you know, inserting some sort of instead of saying, "Listen, this I'm, I'm just the fund administrator. You try to help out." So, what we do, we look at that our other clients, other family office clients, which may have some excess cash that they may may want to invest in other funds. Looking at group clients and that this. It's also the advantage when you have an international network that can help some institutions that are there, you know, 
that um, may, may help this client. So we set up calls, we even travel, do meetings with them. So that thing then, when, when you do that thing, you create a relationship with the client that instead of a client service provider relationship where you just provide the service at the end of the quarter, you send an invoice, you get paid, and that's it. You become more of a partner with the client. So, and, and, and that changes everything then. You know, this the, goes the back perception. to the first point, which I think with the first panel is exactly. that we're very hungry. That, that, that's hungry the, that's the, the, the whole, that changes everything. So then, I want this capital raising point, because mm -hmm. I think we're a bit, a bit tight for time. I think, so once a fund is set up, it's, it's important that, that, that the fund obviously can, can raise capital and be easily distributable. I mean, without going into, let's say, the, the plain vanilla distribution under the passport, given that we've got Alexander here. Alexander, once you've got a Malta fund set up, I mean, what are the routes in order to distribute, to distribute back, back to Switzerland? Let me f first give the question to my colleague Rachel, because we agreed that we share this question. Is that okay for you? Um, yep, yeah, sure. Um, uh, so, first and foremost, to distribute, right, um, EU managers, EU AFIMs are automatically authorized to market the fund. So, um, what they need to do for, for EU AFs is simply go to the notification procedure um, process. Um, any funds outside of the AFMD, so with respect to PIFs, for instance, in order to market, to, to distribute the funds in, uh, in any jurisdiction, they would need to follow the private placement regime, the national regime in that particular jurisdiction. Um, naturally, what, what managers need to, or self-managed funds need to consider is um, uh, Jurisdiction where they need to, where they would like to to market, um, uh, and and who they're going to appoint as distributors, unless it's going to be themselves, where they can um, to to market the funds. With respect to distribution of of any funds in Switzerland, Alexander, I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Rachel. Um, in typically, the client um, needs to understand that there's a like there's a product passport and there's like a activity passport, right? So this is a different two types of passporting, right? So that's important when we come to Switzerland, actually, yeah, we have a slightly more um, flexible or relaxed um, um, regime when it comes to distribution. So um, what, what was my second question? To say, in, in this, the distinction when you, when you represent the fund itself, so if you like on the board of the fund or an IC member or another, um, member of the of this fund um, then you can basically even come to Switzerland and, and, and like do distribution and marketing because you represent the, the company the fund company for example and um, then it may be an advantage that you register also we have an advisor register for um, financial services advisors there's an advisory register also this may in any circumstances not be required, but on a conservative level, it's of course better to be registered and um, be on the safe side. Yes, I think that's, and then even if you are like third party has already mentioned, if you're, I mean, if, if, if you have a passport, um, then you can passport into, into um, yeah, into other European countries, or you can engage like a placement agent or another financial institution here in Switzerland for the for the distribution. Okay, thank you. So, last question, um, because we're running out of time. Um, where do you see um, Malta kind of positioning itself um, going forward? How do you think we will fare in competing for business with with the other fund domiciles? Do you think that asset management has traditionally always been a backbone of our financial services industry? Do you think that um, this will remain this way? Um, how do you think we'll fare going forward as a country? Um, I think um, more than looking at competition, we need to keep looking at ourselves, basically. So, um, okay, you, you need to compare yourself with other jurisdictions, but ultimately you make your own strategy, you have your own strong points, and rather than trying to compete on all aspects, on all levels, on all fund products, on all management products. You have your niche, you know, um, you try to be the best at that. Um, and 
That doesn't mean, obviously, that you turn down any other business, but we need to focus more on ourselves and present ourselves strong at what we are, rather than trying to compete with others and say, listen, they do this and we do that. We, t we, we sort of, we need to show our strengths, show, show our main, main, strong, main strong points in, in, in the, the areas where we excel, and naturally, I think things will progress well as they have done through all these years. I firmly believe that Malta is in a very strong position and we compete well with other jurisdictions. I also believe that we are winning business. Um, however, there is a lot more that we need to work on and we need to work together to achieve more. From a regulatory perspective, I would like to focus more on becoming more efficient, reducing the time frames. The, we keep on working on uh, simplifying our internal procedures and also strengthening our relationship with the industry, with the, um, with, with the existing license holders, uh, because we believe a lot in offering guidance and support wherever that is needed. If I may, I think we largely acknowledge that Malta's, uh, Malta's niche market is for smaller sized managers because of the, um, our, um, our good tax regime and, and low setup costs and ongoing costs. Um, so I, I think it's important to realize where our strengths lie, as Dominic, you have said. Um, and I think the regulator is working very well on, on enhancing that, particularly, for example, on, the, on rendering the MPIF um, also available to self-managed um, funds in, in, in the future. So I think um, we, should, we should work on where our strengths lie, as Dominic said, um, and continue targeting the smaller sized managers. Um, rather than try go for the bigger funds and compete with Luxembourg, for instance. Um. Anything from you, Alex? So shall we wrap up here? Also, um, I, I see really this uh, this trend that we should work strongly together um, between Switzerland and Malta. And I think I mean the fund industry is growing, so we shall grow with this trend. Okay. <laughs>